Hey, sports fans, it's your uh, favorite program, Socialing the Distance. Today, we're featuring one of our big friends, and um, I love saying founder of a magazine or a project, and this is Chris Chavez. He's the founder of Sidious Mag, and he's a longtime writer for Sports Illustrated, and uh, I miss seeing you, man, because, you know, we see each other at events, and that's where we catch up on all the gossip and stuff like that. I know, it's right? It's, it's been a while. I'm, I'm glad we get to catch up over Zoom. Uh, yeah, this would be the time of the year where we're meeting up at, at track meets every single, practically every single weekend. So, um, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we're, we're, we're moving towards, you know, a time period where we can get back to that a little bit. Things seem to be improving. The vaccine rollout is, is happening. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic for sure. Cool. You did something really cool. Uh, I, I totally respect you for doing um, the magazine. And I'm going to send you an E.E. E. Cummings poem that I send to anybody who starts a magazine. It's really cool. It gets banned in schools and stuff, but you're going to get it by your email. So you, it's just called Let's Start a Magazine. And um, you, did, uh, you did the Texas Qualifier and... I watched it. I watched it twice, just so you know. I really, really liked it. I love the shots. I love your fun commentary. It was, it was an over geek, and people could get it right, you know. And and um, you gave a lot of athletes, you know, some street cred, which is really important right now. Um, tell me how you you put that event together. Yeah, so I got you know a message from the uh, Trials of Miles um, race directors. They're you know these two guys, Cooper Knowlton and Dave Alfano, who really honestly like came on the scene about uh, a year ago with just kind of this pivot to virtual racing. And and the two sure. guys hold full time jobs outside of the running world, and uh, they just decided to to start something a little bit different as everyone is trying to adjust to things. And so. Last, you know, it was. It seemed to be a little bit of a hit. They partnered with Tracksmith on a couple different things, and and worked with uh, some other brands. And so, you know, that that was the peak of when virtual racing was was really taking off. And then in the fall, they decided to host two smaller track meets, one in New York City and one in Jersey City. I actually happened, I got a chance to run at the Jersey City one and do a little bit of commentating there. Um, and it, it was really cool. It was, it was, you know, involving a lot of the New York City community runners and some, some a, a handful of professional runners. And so mm -hmm. the idea for them was to stage another one of these track meets um, across the country. And so they, they happened to get the permits to, you know, this school out in, uh, in Austin, Texas. And, um, you know, we were able to follow all the, you know, USATF guidelines for hosting a meet nowadays. And the thing was, it was just sort of like the prof the professionals are kind of so starved for these race opportunities right now because there are. So Chris, you were starting to talk about how the word got out about the Austin meet. I had heard some things about it, saw it on the Twitter universe, and then it just started to pick up. Yeah. So tell us how, how that developed. Yeah. Among the athletes, everyone chit chats. And so over time, I feel like word started to get around about this meet in Austin, Texas. And so it was supposed to be just like a one day thing again with, you know, a handful of elites and maybe mostly geared towards the community and sub elites, but with athletes just so starved for race opportunities, everyone was just signing up and like it, the fields, honestly, for a while. So I was saying the, you know, athletes talk. And so over time, you know, this, this really started to take off for a while. I would, uh, I'll be honest. It felt like we were having a diamond league caliber meet fall on our lap because wow. it was these high profile athletes signing up for this, this race opportunity. Yeah. So it was exciting. Um, and then I was tasked with sort of helping quarterback what the live stream is going to look like. We wanted to hire a really professional crew to handle it. Um, up until this point, I think anything that was streamed on Sidious Mag was just you know, from a iPhone or from on Instagram live. So this was going to be a full scale operation. And so, um, given sort of the chemistry that Kyle and I have had over the last couple of years as, as friends, and also, um, we did a podcast together recently. That was a, that was a hit. Um, I felt like he would have been, he was the perfect person to, to call some of these races with me. And so, um, 
Yeah. And then it kind of just became, let's, let's do something a little bit different. Let's make it free. Let's, let's put it out to as many people as possible um, and, and see how it goes. And so, uh, you know, reading through the tweets and the Instagram messages and the emails that I've received just sort of in the, in the past couple of weeks, like uh, I'm really thankful for, for the outpouring of support that has come from, from the Rona community as a result of it. And it was a lot of fun. We maybe didn't get the, you know, as many fast, times, no American records, no world records, or not even that many uh, Olympic trials qualifiers. But I think it really, you know, provided fans, you know, some really pure racing and what track and field, you know, can be when, when you're just rooting for, you know, whoever it is gets to the finish line first. Yeah, no, I thought you did. I thought the races were compelling. Uh, you had really good fields. I think the joy of dealing with uh, humidity is a challenge. Uh, it's also going to play in their favor if they get some experience with it now, because if we, whatever shape we have the Olympic trials in, they are going to deal with, you know, heat, humidity, whatever, you know, um, the, um, you were talking about it. And that's one of the things I wanted to, to ask you about. Um, you were able to put a crew together to do this professionally, like we're using like a T1 line and things like that, or. So, I mean, logistically, I think what it came down to was Cooper Knowlton, like Googled, uh, you know, live stream team in Austin, Texas. And we just hired out the crew that sent over the best, you know, production reel. And so um, it cost us a pretty penny. Um, and I was working the phones for a couple of weeks, just sort of, uh, you know, getting donors and sponsors to help cover sure. it. Um, and so, because that was the, that was, I think the biggest expense of the whole thing, you know, you could put yeah. on the race, we had the permits and all that kind of stuff. And we made some, they, they, they covered some of the money off of race entries, but really, you know, we were looking at a steep bill for, for, to pull off that, that level of production. And, you know, we're going to do it again in a couple of weeks in Kansas city. Cool. And so I'm going to, I find myself in the same process again as reaching out to a bunch of people to see who can step up and who can help. Um, but really I think what it, what it was, it was like, it had a lot of, you know, a grassroots feel, you know, by, by the people for the people in a way, because yeah. I was, I was, I did an ad read for Pat Price mortgage, which was hilarious to, to some people, but it was, it was fun. And, and it, it was really people who, you know, love the sport stepping up and saying, we want to create these opportunities and we want to present it not just for the athletes, but also for the fans. And so, um, you know, it's definitely not the most stable business model for sure. Um, and I don't, I don't necessarily believe that this is the future and the, and the way things are going to be. I, you know, through my professional experience, having worked for flow track and been, been, having covered the sport. Um, I understand the business model that there needs to be some things behind a paywall and some things make sense to be behind a paywall. So I'm not one of those people who's out there preaching from, from, from the top right now, let's make everything free. Um, I understand that, you know, there is a business to the sport. And so, um, it, it was, it was different, I think. And that, and that's just all we wanted to do. No, I think you guys did some good things. I, I think the, um, when I started doing magazines, I did all my magazines for free because I was trying to, uh, I did a coaching magazine and I got the support for advertising, you know, and that's what we did building our websites too. doing a production of the high quality that you're doing. Like I'm involved right now with the NCAA cross country and we're doing it on live TV and we're dropping $200,000 to, to do it right and as you and i both know when you gotta write checks that stuff gets really scary so you're on the phone a lot you wake up at three in the morning and um no i think what you're doing is fantastic and um you know it's like a, what jesse williams has done with some of his events and it's the community has come together and i think that's one of the biggest lessons and it shows us also the power we have um, how long have you done Sidious Magazine now? So it's been four years. Um, and it's, it's really funny because when, when, when it's referred to as Sidious Mag, um, there really hasn't even really been much of a, of a print production to things. I would say the most mag component to it is the fact that I put out like a weekly newsletter. Um, you know, it was something that I think when I conceptualized, 
in 2017, it was like, you know, I, it'd be really cool to put out sort of a magazine. But in the last yeah. like three or so years, I've definitely leaned heavily into sort of like the podcasting angle of things. And so now we're up to 10 shows about to add another one next week. And so that's been that's been a lot of fun for me. And, and really, it was just carving out a different sort of space because you and I both know just kind of like the, the different places that people can go to for news. You've got the Let's Run homepage that has all the headlines and, and the links yeah. and you've got your flow track and your runner space that has you know all the videos and the workout footage and that kind of stuff and what i wanted to kind of create was just a space that offers things up with some commentary some humor some analysis a little bit more personality and so uh you know i can get geeky on there sometimes and i, I can yeah. you know, be funny on there sometimes so um really i think it's been, it's been a lot of fun for me uh over the last four years and i think it's also helped develop some other people within the running industry as um the, you know, as personalities and, and creators and so uh that's been yeah it's, it's been four years now which is kind of crazy to think about and how long have you written for sports illustrated I'm going on year six now at Sports Illustrated, which is so interesting to me. Yeah, 2015 was my was my first year. Um, and right before I started at SI, I was working with you for for the summer. Um, I and and did a little bit of a a, a tour of uh, of Europe and, and covering the circuit out there. So that, that was that, a lot of fun. I loved seeing how you were doing stuff, you know. And it was like uh, fear and loathing in Houston, man. You know, it was. <laughs> it, it, um, Talk to me about Sports Illustrated for a little bit. How did you get involved there? Yeah, so kind of uh, Sports Illustrated came about in the middle of my senior year. At that point, I had already spent two years, uh, two and a half years, I think, working with FlowTrack from 2012 to 2014. Um, I did an internship at ESPN uh, the summer before, uh, after my junior year of college. And, you know, that's kind of the time period where you're starting to think of like, what's going to come next. And, you know, I was very fortunate to get a job offer from ESPN and, uh, and also from sports illustrated. So at the very end of my senior year, it's not a boat that too many people typically find themselves. And so, uh, I had to weigh that decision, whether I was going to live in Connecticut and, and, and report to the Bristol offices or, you know, come back home to New York city and, 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 and write for sports illustrated. And so for me, I knew that sports illustrated has a rich history of the way that they cover the Olympics. And, mm -hmm. um, and that goes back to, you know, the fifties and sixties. And so I wanted to be part of that. I wanted to really strive to try and make the SI Olympic team in a way where, um, I focused all my attention in 2015 to really stepping up my game and, and, and covering the sport pretty, pretty closely. And, you know, they really did. They made a dream come true for me in 2016. I covered my first Olympics and I remember tearing up in the, uh, during the opening ceremonies. Oh, yeah. I, was, I was like, I can't believe that this is real. And, you know, it all goes back to sort of like when I was in college at Marquette, uh, during one of my freshman year, um, classes, they asked us like what we wanted to do. And we had to write it down on a sheet of paper. And then like the answers were actually like, put it up on a board for us. And I think I'd written, you know, cover the sport, the, the Olympics for sports illustrated. And this is maybe like, oh. and oh, I, cool. Yeah, I would have just like, you know, put that down as like a pipe dream for like 2028 20, or something like that. And, and, you know, that's also me being young and naive and not really even thinking about what the magazine industry would look like down that road. But, uh, yeah, it, it really I honestly say it was a dream come true. And, um, you know, having been there now, you know, four, it's been five years since then, you know, I'm still sort of grinding away and and and. Uh, and helping try and bring some some stories and attention to to the sport that we love uh, on SI. Yeah, the um, so you went to Marquette. Did you run at Marquette? I did not. I picked up running to sort of. I was I was a sprinter in high school, uh, which okay. kind of blows people's minds when they realize that. Uh, but I was very mediocre and below average, and so I got to to Marquette, and then and it was never good enough to make the team or even like get a spot on any sort of like open invitational. So I just started running, you know, casually. Um, I watched the New York City Marathon on TV one day, and I decided I want to do that someday. And, you know, slowly got into it, just started building up, running some 5Ks, 10Ks, and then, you know, a half marathon. And, you know, eventually I did run my first marathon in 2013 uh, in Chicago. I was 19 years old at the time and, you know, fell short of my goal of breaking four hours. And uh, I was hooked, but I was hooked. And I was like, I need to do it again. I need to hit that goal. And it took me three tries yep. um, before I finally did it. And, you know, but when I did end up doing it, 
I, I, I ran Chicago, then New York. And then, you know, a friend of mine was able to get me an entry into Boston and I broke four there for the first time. My head is spinning thinking that's three of the majors. Let's go for the other three now at this point. And so, wow. um, yeah, now I guess in 2019, I was able to run the Tokyo Marathon and, and that was number six for me. And so at this point, I've done all six majors. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, now my, my sights are set on breaking three hours. And, and the, plan is, the plan is to go to Chicago this fall yeah. uh, and kind of it'll be my 10th ever marathon and, and ceremoniously, I guess, return to the place that I ran my first one and totally skip the three hour mark, uh, and just go from running four seventeen or whatever it was in my debut to under three hours. That would be ideal. And that's the goal for this fall. Yeah. It took me eight to break three hours. And the, the, the biggest lesson, I went out too fast every time, you know, and yeah. then I finally went out just at, uh, I went to my first half in, um, uh, uh, 130. And then I came back in one, uh, uh, 21. And wow. That's, was, that's a good negative split there. <laughs> yeah. And it, the, the passing the people in Chicago is a perfect place to negative split because you'll have enough room to do it, you know? And, uh, no, that's all. I'm so proud of you, man. I think that's totally frigging cool. You know, the, Thanks. um, at Marquette, the head coach is a guy named Joe Domek. I ran against him in college. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Cause, um, Joe was at Marquette. I was at Santa Clara and, uh, in 80 and 81, they had the national Catholic invited Notre Dame. So they flew me out from, uh, California and got to run against Johnny Gregoric's dad. Uh, John won that year, dropped a four 16 last mile. Wow. I was back in 12th place, really enjoying the, the view, man. You know, it kind of <laughs> keeps it, keeps it fun. Um, I want to talk about the nature of media right now in sports. Um, and so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to make you the head of world athletics for a day. Okay. And you and John Ridgen sit down and you go, you know, we want to make TV better. We want to make our media better. Give me three things that you would do to make media better. Ooh, this is, this is tough. Um, I'm trying to think, I think my first thing would be kind of, you know, I understand how expensive rights are to all of these events. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, you know, I know NBC pays billions of dollars for the Olympics. So they're going to be obviously so protective of like the footage that comes from, from, from those meets, but it kind of reminds me a little bit of just how MLB major league baseball really is just kind of the, the way that they monopolize and hawk on their footage. It's impossible to really come across like a tweet that has a video of those, uh, of any sort of major league baseball game. And, yeah. you know, if someone does, they get flagged and then they have to take it down and that kind of stuff. And so I understand that there's rights restrictions on things in the, in the ideal and perfect world in this scenario, I would do away with that. And mm -hmm. sort of, because I feel like that is just such a, the the more people that are able to sort of share in the sport, then the more eyeballs it gets. And so that's kind of one thing that, you know, we did with the Texas qualifier meet was just sort of, it was on YouTube and yeah. we wanted, we told everyone who was sort of in attendance there that you can do whatever it is you want with the footage. Like you can film parts of the races, you can toss it up on your YouTube feed. You know, you can take some of the broadcasts and put it up on, on your sort of channels, tweet them out post them on Instagram. And the, the, the people that we invited to be members of the media there ran wild with it. Uh, and that was, and it was great because not only do you get sort of the live event coverage, but in the days afterwards, there's still an outpouring of just different types of content, whether it was photographers publishing their photos, um, that were really cool. Uh, the YouTubers who were there and like pushed out sort of their, uh, videos behind the scenes of what they were doing at the Texas qualifier. The Tin Man Elite guys have their own like sort of YouTube channel where they're able to, you know, Amazing. It's, it's all really cool stuff that, you know, yes, you can all, you'll remember the experience from that meet from watching it, but now all of a sudden you get extra stuff, to, you know, in the days leading up to, to, con to continue riding that high. Um, and so in the ideal world, open the floodgates and let everyone just kind of run wild with this kind of stuff. Um, 
I think another thing that is really important to me um, is sort of the diversity and inclusion when it comes to sort of at least track and field media, um, because, you know, I'll look around in the mix zone, you know, and respectfully, Larry, you know, I look around, and I see it's a lot of old white guys. Um, You're right, man. Tell, I mean, it, it's like um, to get, <laughs> I've been trying to get women in to writing and yeah. it's, um, the numbers that I've got, about 43% of high school track and field kids are African-American, but 11% are Latino. And the number of African-American writers that we have covering, the number of Latino, it's like that, man. And yeah. it, um, So if I see a young kid who's into it, we're going to support it. And, and right now I'm trying to, my goal is to bring in four women into writing Um and, and because those numbers are growing, you know, it's, yeah. it's phenomenal and it's a challenge. No, I, I, I think you're completely correct. Yeah. I mean, I respect, you know, the work you do, the work I see from other sure. people sort of in the, in the mix zone as well. But it's just sort of like for me to look around, not even just even the race component to it as well. I mean, it's just the the the, the average age in there is also a little bit higher. And so, oh my, you yeah, know, yeah. I would love to see younger people in the mix zone with me and, and people of color. I, you know, I, I love the fact that we have Otto Bolden and, and Sonia Richards Ross in the, in the, in the booth analyzing the sprints. But, you know, one big thing I think is like, we're missing, you know, a, a sprints reporter and writer of color who can really own that sort of space. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, kind of, you know, there's still a little bit of planning in the works, but I'm working with a group of people right now to to hopefully sort of launch a program or, you know, a, a mentorship uh, deal where uh, we're able to pair some young professionals and content creators with some, some, some professional people who will offer sort of that guidance. And so um, it's something that I'm really sort of passionate about and I, I really, and, it, and I, given the, you know, the climate and the conversation that was happening in this country last year, um, yeah. I feel it, it's right. It's long overdue. Um, well, but you know, I'm, uh, that's something that I'm super excited about. So, um, yeah, it would be definitely finding sort of those, you know, it, it, I, 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 I'm a, I'm a writer, I'm a writer and a journalist first and foremost. Um, but even just the word, you know, journalist feels a little bit outdated with, with just some of the work that some of these people are doing. When I look at sort of the, the photographers who are great storytellers and, and the YouTubers and that kind of stuff, yep. everyone is using these different mediums and platforms where, you know, the, it's, it's journalism, but in a new age form. And so, uh -huh. respect yeah. So like, I would love to sort of like find a way, you know, if I had the powers that be uh, in, in this scenario to really boost and amplify and, and, and promote and motivate sort of that younger generation, because, you know, we're looking around right now and we see every single sport is trying to figure out how do we appeal to Gen Z? Everyone's cutting the cord on sort of their, their, yeah. their, their subscriptions to, to cable and, and it's getting very hyper-focused on what people like. And so uh, how do we sort of get that attention of the kid on TikTok to get into be a, to, to be a track fan and that kind of stuff. So, you know, I've got a lot of ideas sort of swirling and, and I'm, I'm 27 years old. So like, it's, it's not like I'm one of the, I'm an old guy shaking my fist. It's sort of like the, the way that the, the media landscape is going. I actually want to continue to grow along with it and bring some more people along, uh, along for the ride. Well, I'll challenge you to this, that I will give you the time that you need to do that. And I think you and I should do a zoom thing. And we should offer it to kids, offer it to schools, or we talk about media. I'll talk about the old guy crap. You talk about the new stuff. Because I think the interaction would be fun. Um, and, you know, I just interviewed Lewis Johnson. Uh, absolutely worship the guy, you know. And it's, uh, you're right. There, there, there's, you know, when I got involved in it, I was 26, you know. And um, uh, at, my son was uh, a year old. And we had $5,000 saved. And to get my first magazine, I was a million in debt before I was 30 and then paid it off. You know, and it, it, the beauty is, and, and I don't, that was terrifying every day to wake up and know how much that you owe that kind of money. Um, I was able to pay it off, you know, because built the business, but the beauty of the digital and the beauty of doing print occasionally and things like that, those options are all there. Um, I wanted to tell you something, give you a little pat on the back about the Texas meet too. So Kevin Morris is one of the guys that I work with, photographer. I got photos from him Friday night. I put up 
24 photos, 51,000 retweets. I put up on Saturday another 50, 71,000 retweets. We're going to put them all up again in a, a couple days. And then I read, so people absolutely love it, you know, and, and I keep it short and sweet. And then I, do, I, what I do is I do the little stories on Instagram, you know, where you can tell a little bit more. Um, I haven't figured out TikTok yet, so I'm letting people. Me either. Right? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I mean, we use Twitter. Facebook gets the old folks, but it seems like Twitter and Instagram are the places where our community is, regardless of age. But the numbers skew, like you said, 72% of my readership is 14 to 35 yeah, mm-hmm. when I look at the numbers of the people who watched the Texas Qualifier on YouTube, we will, for one, it was 117,000 people over the course of the two days, which is just like, to think about it, yeah. that's, that's a good chunk of people. It was worldwide. You know, it, it was funny to read the comments afterwards and see people like tuning in from Argentina and Chile and then someone out like in the Netherlands. And so that was yeah. really cool. Um, and the key part, I think, was definitely just sort of looking at the age range. It was people tuned in from eight of the... 57, I think 59% of the audience was between the ages of 18 and 34. And that is a key audience for the sport, I think. Yep. Because yep. I feel like there's a lot of brands and, and and publications and media outlets that really want to hone in on that sort of population right there. And it felt good to just have you know, their att- the, the attention of that many sort of people in that demographic for three plus hours on a Friday and Saturday night. So that is, I, I believe, sort of a little bit of some powerful real estate that going forward, yes, this was, I think, a very important sort of uh, opportunity for not only Sidious Mag to sort of prove that we can put on a track meet like this and and, and yeah. Kyle and I just sort of behind the mic that it was going to be a good product to, pre- to, to watch. The Trials of Miles guys proved that they can host a you know, professional track meet. Um, and so I think those two things blending together and this serving as sort of just our, our card to show now, um, I feel like the, tr- the trials and miles guys lost money on this meet. Um, and it was kind of expected, but I think that going forward, you know, it, it'll ultimately be worth it because the second time around and this third time around and the meet that we're having in Kansas city on, on May 1st and the meet that we're having in New York on May 21st, there's going to be bigger sponsors. I think that probably step up because they are, they'll acknowledge it's sort of like, wow, that many people tuned into the, to, to watch track on a Friday or Saturday night. Let's get involved because, you know, I didn't realize that many eyeballs are going to be on it. So I think, you know, the second and third time around, uh, it'll be a little bit different. Yeah. The, 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 in talking to the advertising community right now, cause I I'm doing it a lot. Uh, they want everybody to be 14 to 25, you know, and then they want a lot of women too. And so what's interesting is that how many women are really embracing it. Um, and that, that age group, you know, your age group is, is, is totally into it. Um, what was the biggest lesson? So I'm going to throw some stuff around right now because the brain is just kind of going and you, you, uh, I love hearing you, uh, talk. Um, what was the biggest lesson you learned from Flowtrack? From Flowtrack, I think it was definitely sort of the networking um, that I that I had just over time there. Like I'm eternally grateful for the opportunity that and the fact that Ryan Fenton read like one of the email that I sent him as a as a high school sophomore or as a college sophomore in 2012 offering to 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 volunteer at, at these sort of meets at the very beginning because at the time they were 20,000 followers and like now you look at them they they've obviously like blown up and so yeah. really he took a chance on me and you know not only that, like I, I sacrificed every single college weekend to travel out to all these track meets whether it was Peyton Jordan or if it was um, yeah. you know Florida relays that was my college experience. I wasn't, you know, hitting the bars in Milwaukee as much as I, I, I love to. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it was, you know, I made that sacrifice and, you know, I, on those weekends, I'd speak to the athletes and coaches and, and then eventually got the chance to go out to Europe and do my first sort of um, summer tour there in, in 2013 um, and really deep inserted those connections with athletes, coaches and agents as well. And those relationships have really been uh, have proven to be super valuable to me now, nine years later, practically. What's the, what's the biggest lesson that you've learned from Sports Illustrated? Yeah, it's a little eye-opening to see just sort of uh, 
um, the type of stories that um, a Sports Illustrated reader uh, embraces from within the sport where it's a little bit different. You, you're catering to a much, much bigger audience. This is, you know, people who go to Sports Illustrated for, for the NBA and for, for the NFL and MLB coverage and all that kind of stuff. Um, they're hearing from for, about these athletes for the very first time. So you kind of do have to uh, educate them in the process of telling a really good story. And so um, that's always kind of very interesting for me to sort of the process of pitching what makes for a good Sports Illustrated story that will appeal to the masses um, because if it was for me, I would, I'd be writing a, a, you know, a profile on every, every runner that I find sort of interesting, but in the grand scheme of things, like there, I obviously know I've got an editor that I want, don't want to bug too often. Um, and it has to be sort of worth it and worth their time and then worth sort of like the, um, what the big payoff will be for Sports Illustrated. So it's a little bit uh, more selective, but you know the attention to detail is definitely greater, I would say. What is the, what's the biggest mistake you made in launching Sidious Mag? I think I sacrificed way too much sleep. Um, it's just a matter of like, yeah. you know, I've, I have some goals for myself athletically as well. And this thing takes up so much of my time where, you know, my duties first and foremost are always to Sports Illustrated. Um, that's my full-time job. And so I commit myself nine to five every single day in doing uh, work for them. And so that means that these pockets of time where I'm taping podcasts, you know, editing podcasts, producing, you know, some of the other shows on our network, creating social media posts and all that kind of stuff. That's all happening on, you know, it post SI hours. And so, sure. uh, and there's only so many hours in the day. I still need to sneak in a run somewhere in there so that I can, you know, continue to, you know, train and, and, and chase my sort of goals. And so by the time 10 or 11 o'clock hits and I'm still, you know, behind my laptop, uh, I start to think, you know, if, if I, if I didn't add on this extra work to myself, I could be getting some extra sleep. I could be, you know, I could have finally broken five minutes for the mile, but you know, I think it's totally worth it because, People seem to be enjoying, you know, the the, the yeah. content that we produce. If it was all of a sudden that, you know, a hundred people were listening to my podcast, I would maybe be much quicker to pull the plug. But the fact that it's, you know, tens of thousands every single week, then yeah, I'm I'm in and I'm gonna continue doing this and and you know, it's not gonna stop anytime soon. What's the thing you love the most about Sidious Mag? I think it's the connection that, you know, I've established sort of with, you know, just the um the people who consume just sort of the, the articles, the newsletters, the podcasts, um, because, you know, it, I always just kind of go back to the thought that with Sports Illustrated, I write these stories and it's very easy to sort of scroll past my name, my byline. But with Sidious, I've been able to develop a little bit more personality behind me. People hear my voice. They get my sense of humor a little bit more when it comes off on a podcast. And, uh, you know, there's a little bit more personality to it. I think people are a little bit more invested in, in me and some of the other people who have, you know, bu helped built up along the way. A Dana Giordano, who's now pu pushing her own podcast and people are following her journey to the Olympic trials. David Melly, who's a friend of mine. And, and, and has these sort of off the wall, funny conversations on his podcast and Scott Fobel becoming a movie buff, like all that kind of stuff, you know, has, has come as a result of this. And so it's that extra layer that's added sort of beyond just sort of beyond the sport. And so it, it, I find it really funny, the fact that people are invested in me trying to break five minutes for the mile, because in the grand scheme of things, I'm, 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 I'm a very below average sort of runner. Uh, but it's, it's fun to bring people along in the process. And so, um, yeah, it, it, I think it's, it holds true to sort of the values that we set for uh, set forth at the very beginning of the, of the site, which was, you know, create something by runners for runners. And then at the same time, it's, it's, it's someone wrote to us once in an email, it was like, you guys, you know, or really match up sort of with the principles set forth in like once a runner, where it's like, this is the type of stuff that people love, uh, yep. who are still giving the sport an honest, you know, shot. And so that's kind of what I always come back to, you know, thinking about, you know, who is it that we're catering to and, and how do we keep everyone engaged? And so that's, that, that's, that makes it so really meaningful to me to, to be a part of it, be able to go to like a, a race or a marathon expo and, and someone, you know, just says, Hey, you know, thanks for getting me through my long run with, by listening to your podcast that, that you know i like that and it, it, yeah. it's a lot of fun yeah 
All right, so I'm going to give you five athletes' names. You're allowed three words to describe them, okay? Um, Usain Bolt. Uh, the best, I would say, yeah. Okay. Um, Elliot Kipchoge. Oh, the greatest then. <laughs> uh, Shelby Houlihan. Super fast. <laughs> Scott Foible. Um, track and fields gambler. Okay. Kyle Merber. Tony Romo attracts Tony Romo. Okay. Um, Sandy Morris. Pushing new heights. Okay. Who's your, what's your favorite event to go to? Favorite event to go to? Um, trying to think. Hmm. I've been to the Monaco Diamond League and I did the whole experience. Yeah, totally uh, cool. Monte Carlo. And wow. that's tough to beat. That is really tough to beat. You know, yeah. the Olympic trials is, is you know, a 10 day sort of marathon, uh, even for the people in, in the in the press, uh, because it's a day in, day out grind. And, and so um, I love I love the trials. Uh, I've only gone to one. Um, but, yeah, I would I would put the trials up there. And, and I'm, I'm you know, it's it's still up in the air what the the summers uh, is going to look like but um no matter what it, what it is I'm, I'm looking forward to making the most of it cool your final thought i'm going to ask you a question um what did you love about your olympic experience i really loved the opportunity to get out to seeing sports that i'd never seen before i think because i was there for sports illustrated i got there you know a couple of days before the opening ceremonies and stayed you know a day or two after um track and field didn't start until the second half. And so the first half of it, um, I was just kind of a general assignment reporter. Um, they would tell me if I had any ideas, go and execute them. Or if they needed someone to go to an event, then they'd send me, I covered, uh, gymnastics for two days. My first ever story from the, uh, for the Olympics was uh, table tennis, which is kind of crazy uh -huh. to think about yeah. because, uh, it's like, you, I never saw it in, in person. I think the, the, for the story I wrote was about the fact that one of the people competing uh, was the first U.S. Olympian born in the year 2000. And that made me feel so old. Uh, and <laughs> I had kind of a little bit of a, a quirky story behind it and and went and did it. And, you know, I got out to see tennis and volleyball. Um, uh, and so it was really cool. Uh, I told myself, I think, sacrifice the sleep. Like once again, I'm really bad at sleep. Uh, sacrifice the sleep to go and see things that you'd never seen before or rarely get the chance to. And so that was that was great. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, it's unfortunate that this this time around, according to like the um, IOC playbook, there isn't going to be that freedom to bounce around from. from that, that's that's a sad one. This would have been my tenth, and so yeah. I'm still trying to figure it out. Chris Chavez, this has been you survived 40 minutes with me, buddy, and uh, we could talk another two hours. And I'm and. Sure. Uh, but I wanted to thank you for all you're doing for the sport. I really thought what you did, that you you did a, you guys did a game changer in Texas, and you should be very proud of yourself. And uh, um, so so ends socialing the distance today. This is Larry Eater with Run Blog Run. We featured Chris Chavez, who is uh, a, a writer for Sports Illustrated, my favorite magazine, and he is also the founder of Sidious Mag. And he just helped put on an incredible event in Texas. Chris, thank you very much. Get some sleep. Um, <laughs> I hope to see you soon at something. And uh, maybe uh, that there's an Adidas event uh, in May. I don't know if you'll go up to Boston for that, but we'll see if we can see each other somewhere and, and uh, you know, talk, share coffee or something. Okay. Thanks so much for having me, Larry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, hello, sports fans. This is your favorite uh, program socialing the distance and uh this is larry eater we are uh we feature today uh chris chavez chris chavez is a uh, a writer for sports illustrated been there for i believe almost seven years he founded sidious mag four years ago um we worked with him back in about 2014 15 when he did a I call it the fear and loathing trip to Houston to 
Europe to cover some meats. He's a graduate of Marquette. Um, one of my favorite people. Um, staunchly believes in sports journalism and the need for it and did his first Olympics in 2016 in Rio. And his first piece was about table tennis, which is pretty cool. Um, at the end of the day, Chris Chavez is a very fine writer and a very fine journalist. And a very fine writer and a very fine journalist can write a, just about anything. The key is, can they take what they've learned and reveal it to you? That's what the greats have done. That's what uh, Tim Laden, that's what uh, Kenny Moore, you know, some of my favorites have done. And uh, Chris Chavez does that. Um, but what I really admire about him right now is the uh, his involvement with the Texas qualifier, the Miles of Trials. It was a wonderful event. 117,000 people saw the streaming over two days. That's kicking butt, okay? Um, and, you know, our photos and stuff like that, it, it was about 71,000 one day and 52,000 another day. So, um, but it's the quality of the event they put together. And uh, we don't have to have world records every time. We need competition. And that's what athletes need right now. And Chris gets that. He's also looking to give opportunities to writers of color, uh, also uh, uh, women writers as well, and uh, to give a little more diverse uh, view of the sport. You know, most many of the writers are old white guys like me, you know, and uh, while I don't consider myself old, I am compared to a 27-year-old, a 24-year-old, or a 14-year-old. Um, and uh, what Chris is challenging us to do is to educate another generation or two. And, and um, that sounds very, very cool. But at the end of the day, Chris is full of enthusiasm, maybe not as much sleep as he needs, but besides that, he's doing pretty darn well. And he was a lot of fun today. And I encourage you to listen to him. There's a lot of things to learn about. This is Larry Eater with Run Blog Run. This is uh, Socialing the Distance. Today we featured Chris Chavez, Sports Illustrated writer, founder of Sidious Mag, and champion of the Texas Qualifier. Um, if you like Run Blog Run, like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you love us, uh, subscribe on the YouTube. And thanks to Mike Deering for putting up with me again. Um, you know, he should get extra pay for it. And I'll try to remember that someday when I, you know, uh, pull out my nickels and stuff like that. But thank you, Mikey. All right. Have a great day.